take you back. It's a blessing to be here. It's been a long time since I've been to the Oakwood Church. Um, several of you have tried to help me calculate when the last time it was that I was here. I was looking through the list of the pastors, and I honestly can't remember. <laughs> so we're here this morning together. It is no accident that God has intersected our paths this morning. And uh, my prayer is as I share some songs that are dear to my heart, as I share some testimony that is personal in my life, that uh, maybe there's a song that is sung, maybe something uh, you see on the screen, maybe a story that is told that resonates with you, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit uses to bring you closer to the foot of the cross. That's my prayer, that's my hope this morning. As I share, um, as Beth said, my wife and my girls are not with me. Usually they tag along with me. I drag them out around everywhere I go. We uh, just got back from Oklahoma camp meeting where it was 107 degrees. That is a, that is a unique kind of camp meeting. There's not a whole lot of camp. There's just a lot of meeting in the air conditioning. So that's just how it is. We're thankful to be back in Michigan where the weather is cooler. Um, this weekend is a little bit... Uh, Abnormal for us. I'll be, uh, I did a program last night in the lakeside area at a, at a pavilion overlooking the lake. I did a concert for them in the, the local town uh, park. And then, of course, this morning I'm with you. And then this afternoon and evening I'll be in the Lake Orient Church. And then tonight, after that concert, I'll be driving to Tennessee for some music rehearsals with the It Is Written music team. And I'll be there until next week. So it just seemed best to let my wife and girls have a normal Sabbath <laughs> for once. So they're not here, but they're here in heart and in spirit. And I will tell you this, the program you're going to see this morning, um, some of you have seen this, uh, many of you probably have not, but it has my wife's fingerprints all over it because she is the one who sits down with me and puts days and days and countless hours of work into putting a program together, a list of songs together. And, uh, and, and if you are blessed by this, I'm telling you, my wife's heart is all over it. And so uh, you'll, you'll have a piece of her here this morning. There's my wife, Heather. And my two little baby girls, Emma, is sitting right next to me. She's the blonde. She's six years old. Aubrey is my little beautiful brunette, and she is four. And uh, they are a blast. They are a lot of fun. And uh, soon, I guess, they'll be involved in their own VBS, I guess, someday. VBS, that was really cool, guys. That presentation was awesome. Proud of you kids that came up here and sang your hearts out. I uh, love seeing our churches serving the community with VBS. It's an awesome, awesome ministry. And thanks to the volunteers who put all the hours in to make it happen. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna start, I wanna share a video with you that uh, just kinda outlines what It Is Written's doing. A lot of you know that I'm the affiliate singer for It Is Written. It's really nothing special. All it means is that I'm contracted to sing for them whenever they need me. So if I get a phone call or an email saying that there is an event somewhere and they would like music for the event, uh, I have to plan on either getting in a plane or getting in our bus and traveling to that event. I sing with them about six months or so out of the year, sometimes seven months out of the year. The rest of the year, I'm doing my own concerts like this one this morning. And uh, many people have asked, how come you don't live in Tennessee? The staff at It Is Written ask me that all the time. <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's one of those things where if I became a full-time It Is Written employee, it would be a blessing in its own way, of course, but I wouldn't get to do what I'm doing for you this morning. Um, I just wouldn't. And this is my jam. Getting up in front and sharing our heart and sharing the testimony of how my family came into the church, that is what I love to do. It is my passion. And so uh, I do this, like I said, half a year, and then I give it as written about half of the year of my time. And it seems to work out pretty good for both of us. Um, it is written has been working hard behind the scenes to continue to evangelize even during a worldwide tragic pandemic. And it has taken on new roles that, you know, God, God finds ways even in tragedy to show up. He just does. It's what God is good at. God is good at saying, hey, I know things are going to get rough, but I'm here with you through it. And I will bring beauty out of the ashes. It's what God does. And so he has, you know, it is written was scheduled to do an evangelistic series in Indianapolis just before the general conference session. You guys remember this? And because of the pandemic, they had to cancel the general conference session. We had to cancel the Ignite Indiana efforts that we had put in. Man, almost a million dollars was invested into that evangelistic effort. We were going to do four series simultaneously in four parts of the city. I was coordinating music for it. I was going to sing and travel between all of the different events and sing different nights. 
Pastor John had talked to me on the phone and I said, what are you guys gonna do now that you're pulling the plug on this in-person evangelistic effort in Indianapolis? He said, well, we can't cancel evangelism. If people are dying, they need Jesus. And so he went to the studio and he began to do his presentations every night in the It Is Written studio. They asked me to come down and record some music, which I did for them in the studio that they could use. And the Hope Awakens series became a national event. It was put out on Facebook Live and YouTube, It Is Written's YouTube channel. One of the things It Is Written decided to do was to do targeted ads on Facebook. Now, they're very powerful. If you guys don't know this already, I'm a former tech consultant. And I can tell you, Facebook is very creepy. <laughs> It knows a lot about you. It does. There's powerful artificial intelligence algorithms that keep track of kind of the things you like and the things you view, how long you pause on certain things you're scrolling through. And so it builds a little bit of a profile about you. And so if three years ago you happened to like your uncle's Bible verse that he posted on his wall, Facebook remembered. And so when people purchase sponsored and targeted ads, they can target people in certain demographics. It is written did that. It is written said, we want this ad to show up in the feed of people who have some spiritual inclination. And so anybody who liked a Bible verse on their uncle's wall three years ago ended up in that category. And then you would have received a targeted ad saying, there's gonna be a Hope Awakens live Bible study event. Facebook Live, here's the address, join us, register. And so people around the country by the thousands we're watching this Facebook Live evangelistic event. When people interacted, when they commented, when they registered, we were able to automatically send that information to the local pastor in their area. And we would tell the local pastor, hey, you have some people interested. They're watching, they're engaging, they're commenting. And so the local pastor would reach out and send a private message on Facebook to them saying, hey, we noticed you're watching this series. I'm the local pastor that's sponsoring this. And if you have any questions, just reach out to me. I'm, we'd love to see you at church. We'd love to visit with you or do Bible studies or answer any questions you have. We're your resource. Feel free to bug us anytime. And so we've been able to keep track of these metrics. And as a result of that Hope Awakens evangelistic series going online, going nationwide, there have been over 3,600 people baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist movement. And this is where God says, out of the ashes, I will rise and bring beauty. So I'm thankful that it is written, continues to push evangelism, even though there are limitations, of course, as to what we can do. And I wanna share this video with you. You're gonna see some of the great things that's happening. And if God puts it on your heart to support your NAD ministry, feel free to do that. Go to itiswritten.tv. Um, I'll try to leave some little interest cards in the back on your literature table. It has a picture of me next to Pastor John. Those are just prepaid cards. You fill them out with your address, put it in the mail, and it is written, we'll send you our magazine. I think we only put it out twice a year, so you won't get it often. But twice a year, we put out this Impressions magazine, and you can see some of the projects we're doing, um, like Eyes for India. You're going to see we're doing free cataract surgeries for people in India. My family's from India, so that's personal for me. That's why I highlight that. Uh, but I think it'll bring a smile to your face to see what your ministry is doing behind the scenes, and hopefully it's a blessing to you. We'll see if I, my clicker is far away from that laptop, so it's gonna, we're going to see if it actually plays nicely. Get up there. Maybe I push the signal. There we go. <laughs> For over 60 years, It Is Written's mission has been to reach as many people as possible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. From TV and radio programming in English, Spanish, and American Sign Language to resources such as our Bible study guides, It Is Written continues to redefine modern evangelism. We've expanded our evangelistic resources to make it easier for you than ever before to share the gospel with others. We've also launched multiple humanitarian projects that have opened hearts to the gospel like never before. It is written, Eyes for India gives sight to the blind, and Mission Mongolia provides free medical care to thousands of Mongolians. People who would never have been interested in the gospel are picking up a Bible in their own language and learning about God's incredible love for the very first time. Our humanitarian projects, our television and internet programming, and our evangelistic resources are all designed around one common goal, to see people make lasting decisions for Jesus. 
We see those decisions being made every year as we conduct evangelistic series all over the United States and in countries such as Zimbabwe, Italy, Australia, Moldova, Peru, Colombia, and Cuba. Join us and get involved today. A lot of really great, great things happening around the world. And it's a blessing to be a part of it at some level. I want to start this morning by singing a song. This happens to be one of Heather's favorite songs. And it's a song of invitation. You know, we're in God's house. If Jesus were sitting right next to you in the pew face to face, you could see him and you could converse with him. You know, he knows the kind of week that you've had. He knows the month that you've been enduring. He knows the kind of year it's been. But today, he invites you to come into his presence, get close to him. Go to the foot of the cross, take the burden that is on your shoulders and leave it there. I have a habit of leaving my burdens at the foot of the cross, maybe in prayer, and then I'm ending my prayer and I just take the burden and I put it back on. And God says, just leave it. I can take care of this. And that's what this song celebrates, just coming into his presence, leaving our burdens there. This is Sabbath. This is our time with him. I pray this song blesses you. Come when your heart is heavy laden, feeling like the joy is fading. Just come. You know, in so many ways, I have to say that the, the connection that I have with God has been a parent-child connection. You know, I think the, the dynamic that exists in your life as a child and you're growing up, what do they call it? They call it your, your, your formative years. It has a lot to do with who you become later on in life. It does. It's a dramatic effect. It's true. If you grew up in a healthy, nuclear, copacetic family dynamic, mom and dad loved each other, they loved God, they loved you, then healthy relationships were the foundation upon which you built 
the rest of your healthy relationships. I mean, it's true. It's what was modeled to you. See, when you got older and you started to make friends, you knew how to build a healthy relationship with your friends because that was your default setting. That's normal to you. And then later on in life, you met that special someone and you got married and you knew how to build a healthy relationship with your spouse because that's what was modeled to you. And later on in life, you had your own kids and you just passed on that beautiful, healthy family dynamic to your kids because that's what was modeled to you. And ultimately, you build a healthy relationship with God. And that's what he intended the family unit to be, was the foundation of our relationship with him. Now, Satan knows this, too. And here's, here's the thing. He's got all these years to study the family dynamic, and he knows what to do to divide and conquer the family. And he's gotten pretty good at it by now. So in my family dynamic, our home was broken more than once. And here's what tends to happen. When you grow up in a home of broken relationships, then that becomes your default setting, doesn't it? So someday when you build friendships with your friends, you're not sure how to make healthy relationships. You're not sure how to build a healthy relationship with your spouse. It wasn't modeled to you. You build broken relationships someday with your own kids because the cycle continues. That's what's normal to you. And you can even build a broken relationship with God. I'm telling you this from experience. So unless God comes along and says the cycle is going to stop right here. The cycle will just continue on for generations. I don't know why he did, but God chose me to break the cycle. My great-grandparents were divorced. My grandparents were divorced. My parents have been married three times each. My aunts and uncles on both sides have been divorced. My cousins have been divorced. Now we're at my generation. It is an epidemic in my family. And God said, we're putting the brakes on with Scott Bennett. We're not doing this anymore. Praise the Lord, he chose me. Heather and I are going to celebrate 13 years of marriage this year, and we are headed straight to 50. It's awesome. I love what we have. She is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And those of you who know me and know our dynamic would agree. Now, what is it that God did in my life to help me learn a new normal? You know, I remember having a conversation with Heather, and, and we talked early on. Uh, before we were engaged, we started getting serious. You know, we had been dating a year, and we realized that we had something really awesome between each other. And so we started talking about marriage, and I was very frank and honest. We were very good communicators, her and I, always have been. And I said to her, look, I want you to go into this eyes wide open because my statistical risk for divorce is through the roof. Seriously, I have a greater chance for divorcing than I do for sticking it out. And she kind of looked at me and she said, well, you know, what does eyes wide open look like to you? And so I remember telling her, I said, well, I think we should get premarital counseling. You got to get these third parties, these disinterested people on the outside looking in to give you honest feedback. That's the best thing I could think of. And so she, she agreed, and so we, we did premarital counseling with, with a pastor that knew her since she was young. He was awesome. Did several months of premarital counseling with us, and then, and then when we were done, uh, you know, I asked him straight out. I said, what, what, do you feel like we're compatible? Do you see red flags? Be honest with me. You know my history. I don't want to mess around, and I certainly don't want to hurt this beautiful girl. And he leaned over his desk and he looked at me straight in the eyes and he dead serious. He said to me, look, I promised myself years ago, I married a couple, he said. And there were red flags all over the place. And I married him anyway and they were divorced within a year and I promised myself I would never do that ever again. So he said, if I saw red flags, I would tell you right now. But all I see is two loving people, fully compatible and blessed by God. Oh, thank you. My wife is excited. What do you think, honey? I said, I think we should do it one more time. <laughs> Bless her heart, she's so patient with me. I said, listen, I have a pastor. He knows my family dynamic. I grew up with him. He knows the whole thing. He baptized me. Why don't we do one more session of premarital counseling with him just to make sure? So, so we got a guy that knows you. Now we got a guy that knows me, right? We can't go wrong. Said, okay, okay, she said. And so we did another few months of intense premarital counseling with my pastor. He did something different. He had us take the prepare and enrich tests. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? And we took them. 
And uh, it takes, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's a very intense uh, premarital test that you take. And it's, uh, it's a dynamic test, they call it dynamic testing, because the answer you give changes the next set of questions. Very simply put, if the question is, do you want to have children, and you say no, then it completely disregards any of the questions about kids, and it takes you down another path of questions. If you say, yes, I want to have children, it asks you, how many? Do you care about what gender? What religion do you want to raise them in? So we were told to take these tests separately, and we did. In fact, Heather and I did not communicate for an entire week so that we could take these tests um, without accidentally... Correct, yeah. I, we just did, we didn't want to... We didn't want to adjust the dynamic of the test. So, so we, we didn't talk for a week. We each took this test. It took us each several days to do. It was very, very intense. And uh, at the end of our premarital counseling sessions with my pastor, uh, it was like two or three months, we, uh, we sat down with him, and, and he, we, we asked him the same question. How do you feel about our compatibility? And uh, he said, well, I've never told you guys what your test scores were. I didn't want to. I wanted to finish these sessions. But but I'm going to tell you, first of all, in, in my perspective as a, as a pastor who's done premarital counseling for 30-something years, you guys are so beautifully compatible. I think you guys are going into this eyes wide open. You're going to have an awesome future ahead of you. And he says, and besides which, I've done these prepare and enrich tests for as long as I've been counseling. And I've never once until now seen a couple get a 100% score on their prepare and enrich test. He said, so you have my blessing. So praise the Lord, we set a date we got married, and it's the best thing we ever did. You know, if you can live with your wife in a 40-foot tour bus all the time, you got something special going on. What God did to help me to reset my default setting, he began to put people in my life, mentors. I mean, I can name them. He put men in my life who showed me what it was to be a God-fearing father. I got to watch them. He put men in my life who showed me what it was to be a God-fearing, loving husband. I got to see it, and it's, it's admirable. You know something good when you see it. You know, wow, I want to be like that, I would say to myself. He put couples in my life who showed me what a healthy marriage dynamic looked like, healthy conflict resolution. He began to put parents in my life who showed me what it was to parent your kids in a God-fearing manner. And over time, my default setting began to change. I realize there's something better than what's been going on in my family for generations. We can do things different. And you can have a bad childhood and you can have a good life. I'm telling you, stop blaming stuff on your childhood. God can give you an awesome life in spite of what's happened to you as a kid. I'm a walking, living, breathing example of that. So God took a very much a father role in my life. A one consistent presence from day one until now. My wife will tell you, whenever I pray, it always begins with Father. That's just how we are. And so I want to sing a song that celebrates this, this parent-child dynamic. I want to celebrate it. I want to celebrate that God can be a parent in your life. You know, he's good at filling those voids. For me, it was a dad-shaped void. You know, maybe for you, it's different. I don't know. But God fixes the hearts. He stitches pieces back together. He's the fix-it God. He's very good at it. And he's the God that fills the voids. He's the God that is the ultimate dad, the ultimate parent. And he has been in my life. And you cannot outgrow his love. You can't. You will never outgrow his love. You will never fledge the nest of God's love. It doesn't happen. I tell my kids all the time, you're my baby girls. I love you. Oh, man, my oldest, Emma, she's six. You know, she gets kind of a, a little annoyed. She says, Dad, I'm not a baby. Why do you keep calling me a baby? Emma. You're my baby girl. No, Dad, I'm a big girl. You can't call me that. And I looked at her straight in the eye, and I said, I can call you my baby girl if I want to call you my baby girl. In fact, get used to it, because I'm going to call you it more. <laughs> so I actually sat down with her once, and I said, hey, you're not a baby. I recognize you're growing up. I'm proud of you. I give her tons of responsibilities. But I also remind her that in my eyes, she's always going to be my baby girl, always. I said, Emma, it's just a thing. You're going to understand someday, but dads and daughters, we have this thing. You know, when she's 40 and finally allowed to date, she's still going to be my baby girl. Nothing's going to change that. God sees us the same way. You cannot outgrow his love. You just can't. You know, we're going to go through life and we're going to make mistakes. You might be a baby Christian. You're holding on to the pinkies of God. You're learning to walk in your faith for the first time. I know what that's like. You might be a mature Christian. You're the person that has been walking with God your entire life. By the way, you're the pillars of the church. I appreciate you. Thank you for mentoring me. 
Along that journey, we're going to fall flat on our face, make mistakes. And God doesn't just look at us and go, you know, you've been a Christian all your life. How could you make such a newbie mistake? This is not who God is. That's not his character. His character is, I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to dust you off. We're going to try this again, but we're going to try it my way. That's why I sing this song. Because you will always be a child in his eyes. I was there the first time When you drew the breath of life I could hear your voice The first time that you cried And though you couldn't see Something now that I want you to hear You will always be a child in my eyes And when you need some love, my arms are open wide And even as you're growing old, I hope you're in my eyes and I was there the first time that you prayed and I heard all those promises that you made yeah. but when you fell before me crying father again As you will always be a child in my eyes and when you need some love my arms are open wide and even as you're growing old I hope you'll realize that you will be a child in my eyes. You will always be a child in my eyes. And when you need some love, my arms are open wide. Yes, they are. And even as you're growing old, I hope you're realize. You will always be a child in my eyes. Yes, you will always be a child in my eyes. You know, I have to say, when Emma arrived, it was quite an intense experience for us. You know, she was the one that made us parents for the first time, so we were new to the whole concept. And we happened to be on tour in Texas, living in our tour bus. Texas was a place that we had been called to. It's a whole long story of how we ended up there. But when we arrived in Texas, we didn't know anybody. We were strangers in a foreign land. So we parked our bus at this really beautiful RV resort that was Adventist owned, and the lady who was running it was a sweet 80-year-old Adventist lady. And Miss Annette, when we rolled in, said, welcome to Texas. I know we've got you scheduled to sing at my church at some point in the next month. We're excited to have you. Here's my cell phone number. If you ever need anything, you just let me know. Later on, we became very, very close friends with Miss Annette. She's a sweet widow 
who ended up taking us out to eat twice a week because she just loved the company. While we were there, Heather was pregnant. And I'll never forget October 2 of 2015, five in the morning, my wife wakes up and she's having contractions. I was excited. I thought, we're going to have a baby today. <laughs> my poor wife, she didn't know what to expect. So we go to the hospital. You know, we had toured the labor and delivery floor of Texas Health Harris Methodist Hospital. It's one of the top 10 labor and delivery hospitals in the United States. We knew we were in good hands. They had taken us on this tour for a couple of hours. They showed us the rooms, the rooms that likely Heather would be in. They showed us the, all the equipment in case things went a little bit wrong. And they showed us the team of physicians they had, emergency physicians. It's amazing. This place was awesome. The entire seventh floor of the hospital dedicated to labor and delivery. Double sets of locked doors because we're a lockdown facility. We want your baby to be secure. Your baby will never leave your room, they told us. And I said, well, what if something goes wrong? And they said, we have all the equipment here. And I said, well, I don't see any of the equipment. And they grabbed these beautiful curtains that were on top of this beautiful mahogany cabinetry. And they ripped those curtains off. They were Velcroed on. And there was all the scary equipment. <laughs> Your baby will not leave this room. Unless your baby needs emergency surgery, your baby will not leave this room. You're here, and they're here. Cool. So that morning, we knew what to do. We punched in floor seven. We went up to the seventh floor, and they admitted my wife, and they started putting probes on her belly. I could see her contractions before she could even feel them on the screen. And the doctor came in, and he said, listen, uh, we've done some checks and tests, and you're not having a baby today, honey. My wife was like, what do you mean? He said, look, you're having Braxton Hicks contractions. These are just the practice ones. And my poor wife, I remember her saying, well, what do the real ones feel like? <laughs> and he was honest. He says, I don't know. But I can tell you right now, you're not having a baby now. You're not having a baby tomorrow. Your body's nowhere near ready having a baby. Call me next week when they're five minutes apart and we'll talk. Oh, okay. So they gave her a little medicine to relax those contractions, sent us back home. That night, my wife went to bed early. She's pretty exhausted. The next morning, I was scheduled to preach and sing at the Jefferson Academy Church in Jefferson, Texas. Now, our bus was parked in Keene in the Cleburne area by Southwestern Adventist University. It's a three-and-a-half-hour drive from there to Jefferson. Jefferson is on the Louisiana border. It's far east Texas. And I said to my wife when I woke up on Sabbath morning, I said, are you sure you want me to leave? She said, yeah, go ahead. You know, her physician had said, I don't want you going on long trips. I don't want you far away from the hospital. I don't want you having a baby on the road. So start to stay home. You're getting close to your due date. Don't go. Let your husband go do his thing. You just stay in the bus. You're close to the hospital. You're not going to get blood clots in your legs from sitting in the car. You know, they had all these reasons. So he said, fine. So I knew I was going solo. My wife said, listen, I feel great. Go ahead and go. I said, okay. And I did. And I went all the way to Jefferson. I set up my sound system. I sat down at the piano. I was singing. In fact, I was in the middle of one of my songs. And my phone was sitting there on the uh, music stand of the piano. I always leave it there. My wife and I will text each other often during a concert. It's our thing. And she sends me a text, and it dings through. I can't hear it. I just hear the vibration as my phone vibrates against the wooden music stand of the piano. Bzz, bzz, bzz. And in the middle of me singing these lyrics, I just steal a glance. And there's that preview of that text message coming in, and it says, my water broke. I was halfway through this song, so I had a minute and 25 seconds left to figure out what I was going to do. And I, I'm, I'm telling you, I was in autopilot at that mode. I don't even remember what I was singing, but I know it was in full autopilot mode. I'm just, the lyrics are just coming out. The fingers are just playing because my brain is focusing on other stuff at that point. And I realized in that minute and 25 seconds, there's no other decision to make. I have to go. My wife is having a baby. So I get up from that piano I stand up and I said to the congregation, listen, I'm sorry to do this to you, but I got to leave. My wife is in Cleburne having a baby. And they gave me a standing ovation. It was the only one I'd ever gotten. <laughs> and I marched out of that church. They helped me load my sound equipment in my truck. And I started driving. I get another call from Heather at that point. She says, I called Miss Annette to take me to the hospital. I said, well, that was a good move. She's like, yeah, well, she was playing the organ at church. <laughs> and she got up in the middle of a song and ran out of that church to go get my wife. Bless her heart. I said, are you at the hospital? Yeah, I'm at the hospital. And she was crying. I said, what's wrong? She says, I can't do this without you. 
This wasn't part of the plan. She said, you're my rock. You got to get here. I did not remind her that I was three and a half hours away. I just said, I'm on my way. I'm driving in the truck. Just tried to give her some hope. I said, hey, can you put me on the phone with the charge nurse? And so the next thing I know, the charge nurse says, hey, this is whatever, Vicky. Hey, Vicky, I'm three and a half hours away. Is there any chance I'm going to make it? She said, nope. She's going to have this baby in 20 minutes. I said, Vicki, that's not what you told us yesterday. I remember yesterday. I said, I'm going to get there as fast as I can. That's all I can say. Take good care of my wife. Miss Annette was in the waiting room. She called me next. She was distraught. She said, honey, in her southern Texas accent, I can't do this. I'm too old for this. She said, you got to get here. And I said, I'm trying. <laughs> so my wife is alone in this hospital with nobody she knows, about to have a baby. I just said, God, please. I was here on your bidding. Please let me make it in time. And if I don't, protect my wife. And so I just drove. Now, I got this idea, and I honestly believe this. You probably, some of you are not going to agree with me, and that's okay. We can beg to differ. But I believe the Holy Spirit prompted me to call Texas Highway Patrol. And I did. They call them DPS in Texas, Department of Public Safety. Got on the phone with them. This lady answers, dispatch, what's your emergency? I explained to her what was going on. I said, my wife is in Cleburne having a baby. She's upset. She's distraught. She's alone. We're not from here. I was in Jefferson on business, I told her. And I'm trying to get back to the hospital in time. What can you do for me? And so she puts me on hold for probably, I don't know, more than 60 seconds. And when she comes back, she said, listen, any other day of the week, I would have sent a patrol car. A state trooper would have escorted you there. We could have done that. We'd do that. She said, but today we have this football game, and the state troopers are running security for this football game. Look, you know, guys, I'm, I've just never been into football, and I kind of dis dislike it even more now because I didn't get a... <laughs> it got in the way. She said, here's what I did. I put a radio bulletin out to the state troopers that are running the three counties that you're going to cross. The township police, anybody that's running interstate patrol. And I gave them a description of your truck. I gave them your license plate. They know your story, and they're going to give you a free pass. So just get there, but honey, get there safely, she said to me. And I said, I can do that. And as I hung up, I pushed down, and I got there. I did it in about an hour and a half. Later on, you can do the math on that. I rush into there, I punch in floor seven on the elevator, I rush up to floor seven, the elevator doors open up into the waiting room for labor and delivery. It's the place where everybody's waiting for babies to be born. The nursing staff had said to the people in the waiting room, if you see a guy come through that elevator door wearing a suit, make some noise, let us know, because we gotta get him into his wife's room. She's pretty upset. So they were all looking, you know, they're bored, they have nothing else to do, let's look for the guy. The elevator doors are opening. So finally they open up and I'm coming through and I get my second standing ovation of the day. I couldn't believe it. Two nurses show up, punch in codes to these double sets of locked doors, whisk me off to Heather's room. I walk in there. Can you believe it? My precious wife. She has held on for dear life. She hasn't had our baby yet. Can you imagine that? Almost two hours. She just hung on. I was able to be there to be with my wife for this momentous occasion. I was able to be there and welcome my girl into the world. I was there, able to be there to cut the umbilical cord. I always tell my kids, God created you and mommy made you and daddy made your belly button. <laughs> Later on that night when I had a chance to come off of that adrenaline rush and my wife was finally resting, she was exhausted after the heroic thing she had just done. I was holding Emma They'd given her to me. They said, Dad, we want you to take your shirt off because we want your baby to be skin to skin. So I was holding her against my chest. Oh, she was sleeping. She had had her first bath. She'd had her first feeding. She, she just had her first diaper change. She's just tiny. She was six pounds. Emma was tiny. I'm just holding her, and she's beautiful, and she's sleeping. And oh, It's the first time I remember feeling the weight on my shoulders of fatherhood. Oh, this is my kid. I remember breathing prayers to God, Father, I have no idea what I'm doing. Save this child, save her in spite of me. I mean, I felt it. 
I knew it was a big deal that I was holding somebody in my arms who was going to be somebody someday, who was going to have a, an influence on the world. And I wanted God to give her a purpose in life. She's hours old, and I'm already wondering what my daughter's purpose is going to be. I'm telling you, as I'm watching her grow up, we're seeing this hugely compassionate side of her. It's beautiful. When she was just a toddler and she couldn't even talk, I remember one of my friends fell backwards. He was leaning his chair back. Fell back, hit his elbow on the concrete, and he was going, ow, ow, ow. I mean, she rushed over. She didn't even know this guy. Rushed right over to him, was holding onto his elbow. Okay, okay, she was asking. And that's who she is today. Hugely compassionate. I keep telling her, Emma, you're going to be a nurse someday, man. You're awesome. I don't know what God is going to do with her life, but it's going to be something great. If she chooses another path, that's on her. But I'm raising her right now to understand that it's important to have a purpose in life, Emma. It's important. You can't go through life on accident, living on accident, just rolling with the punches. People do. They have no idea what their purpose is. I'm going to share with you a video. You're going to see people. This was in Texas. A church in Texas decided to get the spiritual pulse of their city. You know how they did it? They put people out on the streets and started interviewing them. Interviewing them. Ask them questions. It's what Jesus did, by the way. That was Christ's method. He took care of what people's needs were first. He didn't preach to the guy who had a withered hand until after he had healed his withered hand. He didn't preach to people until he fed them. If they were hungry, feed them. Then I'll preach to them. Mary. Jesus became her friend, healed her heart sickness. Then he shared with her what he knew, and it transformed her life. And this is what this church wanted to do. Why don't we get the spiritual pulse of our city and figure out what sickness people have in their hearts, and then we can be there to treat it. I thought it was a cool idea. The result of this interview is pretty amazing to me. People are being asked, what is your purpose in life? And their answers are what you're about to see here on the screen. What is your purpose in life? I don't think I have one. What is your purpose in life? Uh, I haven't figured that out yet. Have you ever thought about it before? Nope. You've never thought about it? Nope. Not at all. <laughs> uh, I haven't spent any time on it. You haven't spent any time thinking about what your purpose is in life? Not recently. Should I be? Will you tell me? It's your life. No, I haven't spent any time on that. I just go day to day. That's just it. What is your purpose in life? Uh, I really haven't put that much thought into it. Why not? Uh, I don't know. I'm just trying to have a good time. What is my purpose in life? You got to give me time to think about okay, that think one. About it. Mm, get through it. Don't kill anybody. Just keep doing, doing until I get it over with. Just be happy. It's just to be happy. I think that I should have fun and uh, be happy. To, um, to be happy and make my family happy and my boyfriend happy and just be happy. I don't really feel that I'm here to do anything in particular. I mean, it's not like I think that I'm destined to do something or be someone or something like that. I'm just kind of going through the routines, you know, as society's laid it all out for us. I feel like I have a purpose to help preserve, conserve uh, the beauty of nature. Hopefully leave some sort of legacy. To contribute to the betterment of mankind. Tell me what your purpose in life is. Mm, go to work, go home, live. You gotta, I don't I got a purpose. Everybody got a purpose on earth, but I ain't found my purpose out yet. To live a long life and to be prosperous. What's my purpose in life? My purpose in life is uh, to be successful. To be successful and to lead a happy, fulfilling life. To provide well for my family. I want to be a really powerful uh, woman, build my career built in financial area. Do you think that you have a purpose? Uh, not necessarily. I think purpose is just to do what you want to do. Go out and live life and have fun. Yeah, I think everybody has a purpose in life. And what would that purpose be for you? Uh, I'm not sure yet. What is your purpose in life? My purpose in life is basically to live the best life I can and to help others and be there for my friends and my family. How do you know that that's your purpose? Where does that come from? It comes from within my heart and my head. How do you know having fun is your purpose? Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's just personal philosophy. Get it from what I think, that's it. How do I know this is my purpose? What kind of question is that? Boy, I think you gotta start drinking before you talk about that, really. What is your purpose in life? Um, my purpose in life, um, I, I am uh, deeply rooted in the uh, Christian faith, and uh, uh, my purpose would be to uh, glorify God and all that I do. Do you have a purpose in life? Uh, no. Have you ever thought about it before? I guess I've thought about it a little, but it scares me, so I don't. 
What do you mean it scares you? Um, I don't know. I just like to more concern myself with living day to day, having fun. And that's it? That's pretty much it. Uh, I mean, yeah, more or less, we're just going through the motions here and, you know, you do what you, you feel like doing. I don't think there's anything really pushing or pulling us in any direction. And, uh, you know, it ends whenever your life ends. It ends whenever your life ends. It's sad, but that's what people think. And that society that we live in today believes that they have no purpose in life. You know, can you imagine how Jesus feels knowing what he did for us? to see people say, I have no idea what my purpose is. I would imagine it breaks his heart afresh. That is our mission field. These are the people who we're supposed to come up to and say, hey, respectfully, you do have a purpose. The Bible says when you were formed in the womb, you were set, a, set apart. It's God's way of saying you're special. I have a purpose for you. Inspired writings and remind us that we should every so often dwell on the closing scenes of Christ's life. Lest we forget. And so as I sing this song, my simple prayer is that you would appreciate what Jesus did, what his purpose was to give you and I a purpose in life. Walking on the road to Jerusalem The time had come to sacrifice again My two small sons, they walked beside me on the road and that they came was to watch the lamb, yeah. Oh, daddy, daddy, what will we see there? There's so much that we don't understand, no. So I told them of Moses and Father, said, dear children, watch the lamb, for there will be so many in Jerusalem today, and we must be sure the lamb that it doesn't run away, and then I told them of Moses and a father. said, dear children, watch the lamb. When we reached the city, I knew something must be wrong. There were no joyful worshipers and no joyful worship songs. I stood there with my children in the midst of angry men.
stood there weeping. I heard the oldest say, Father, please forgive us. The lamb, the lamb ran away. Oh, daddy, daddy. What if we sit here? There's so much that we don't understand. No. So I took them in my arms and we turned and faced the cross. And then I said, Dear children. Watch the Jesus had a purpose. Sometimes God calls us to do hard things. Your purpose in life may be hard. He may ask you to do something that is uncomfortable. Sometimes when he asks us to do hard things, we try to shirk our responsibility, try to pull a Jonah move. And you know, when we take the time to contemplate what Jesus did for you and I, realize how shameful it is to say, God, I don't want to do this for you. Because God held nothing back for us. He was all in. And so sometimes he's going to ask us to do things that are hard, and we're going to say, God, you did something very hard for me. The least I can do is do something hard for you. So instead of us wondering, God, can I do this? Like Moses did. God, should I really be doing this? Like Jonah did. We say, God, here I am. Send me. I'm going to close in a minute here with a video of a father and a son together doing something hard. God has called them to do something hard to inspire humanity. And you're going to see a microcosmic example of our relationship with God. God saying, I want you to do something hard, but I'm going to be behind you pushing you every step of the way. You're not going to do it on your own. We're in this together. But before I close with this song and this video, I'm going to leave you with this thought process that sometimes God asks us to do things that are not hard. And sometimes because something is not hard and it doesn't seem like a big deal, we tend to overlook these opportunities we have to share our faith with people because it doesn't seem like a big deal. And so we think of it as insignificant, but nothing God asks you and I to do is insignificant. It's not. And the perfect example of that is my own family and why we're in the church. And, and I'll make this short. But my mom is a former Muslim. She came, my whole family on my mom's side of the family is from India. They grew up Muslim. That's all they know. They're from the, the, the state of Bihar up in northern India. It's, it's a primarily Muslim population up there. So my mom, all she knew was Islam. In her, in her early 20s, she decided she didn't want Islam to be in her life anymore. She didn't want to be a part of Islam. She didn't care for the God that was portrayed in Islam. She told the family, I'll never make him happy. He's never happy with me, and I'm not going to keep trying. And so she left the, the Islamic faith. She left the family. She comes to New York City in her 20s, starts to live what she thought was the good life. It was a hard life. It did not treat her well. Eventually, she meets my father, who was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. My father, at the time, was a self-proclaimed agnostic. He would tell you that there's probably a God somewhere. He definitely does not have time for me, and I certainly don't have time for him. We just stay out of each other's way. 
So my mom and dad got together, got married, they had me moved to a little town called Allentown, Pennsylvania, trying to get out of the big city. And in Pennsylvania, my dad is an alarm salesman selling alarm systems for people's homes. They're struggling financially at that time in their life. Later on, God blessed them, but this was a period of struggle, and I think it was a deliberate period of struggle. God had a plan for them and needed their attention and needed them not to be distracted with stuff. And so he allowed them to go through this period of famine. They were living in this apartment complex that had no laundry facilities, and so my mom would, you know, with my brother and I constantly going through laundry. I was just a baby. I was 1984. My mom would have to go every week into town to do laundry. It was her routine. And what she would do is she would put the coins in, and she'd put the laundry in, and she'd put the soap in, and she'd start the machine. And then she'd sit down by the magazine rack, and she'd grab her favorite magazine, and she'd flip through it while the laundry was going. It's a two-hour ordeal. It's the most boring place you could ever be in their life is a laundromat. So she would pass the time reading whatever magazine was there in the magazine rack. This was her routine. She did it every week for years. This particular day, she did it just like she always does it. Put the coins in, kerchunk the little tray in there, put the soap in, started the machine. Went and sat down next to her favorite magazine rack and reached for her favorite magazine, and it wasn't there. When she looked to see if there were other magazines there, she noticed that there were no magazines in the magazine rack, nothing. It was empty. She leaned over to look inside. Maybe something fell over sideways in the rack. Nothing. The more she looked, the more she realized this was going to be a long two hours. And then her eyes spotted something. It was a little book stuck in the back of that magazine rack. Oh, yes, something to read. I'm saved. <laughs> she picks this book up, and she flips it to the front cover, and it says, Helps for Bible Study. Boy, was she disappointed. Oh, the only thing in this entire laundromat is some crazy religious book. Out of sheer boredom, praise the Lord for sheer boredom. My mom began to flip through that book. And she's reading things she's never heard of before. She's reading about the state of the dead, what happens when you die. Muslims have a complicated view of life after death. Just look it up. I don't have time to tell you right now what it's like. Just look it up. She's going, wow, this is amazing. Seriously? She's reading about the Sabbath. She can't believe she's reading about the Sabbath in a book that is obviously a Christian book. She thought the Sabbath was a Jewish thing. What, there are Christians that go to church on Saturday? Is that serious? Seriously? And she's reading this, and she's kind of weirded out, but she's kind of fascinated. And so she takes it home to my dad. She says, look, I grew up a Muslim. I know nothing about Christianity. Have you ever heard of any of the stuff in this book? you got to read this. My dad begins to read it that week. And he's flipping through it, and he goes, I've never heard of any of this stuff. And they get this idea, which I believe, again, was the Holy Spirit, to go out and buy a Bible. There's these Bible references scattered throughout this book supporting the theories that it's presenting. And so my parents thought to themselves, you know, if this stuff is really in the Bible, we'll find it. But if it's not, we're going to call their bluff. And so they went to a Christian bookstore, and they asked the clerk, can you sell us a normal Bible? And he had no idea what they meant by that. They said, we don't want a Bible put out by some denomination that's going to be slanted a certain direction. We want a Bible the way it came from, from the, when the Bible was born. <laughs> and the clerk said, if you can't read Hebrew, Hebrew, if you can't read Hebrew or Greek, um, this is not going to be helpful to you. And they said, well, what's the next best thing? And I don't know what he sold them, some Bible. I'm guessing it was a King James. I have no idea. So they took home this Bible, and my parents, in their spiritual depraved minds, realized that if something was in the Holy Bible, it probably had credibility. This is amazing. This is, this is proof that the Holy Spirit has been able to preserve the integrity of God's Word throughout the annals of time. To the point where my formerly Muslim mother and my agnostic father realized that if it was in this book we probably can safely believe it. I mean, God's Word was planted in their hearts. They didn't even realize it. And so they take this Bible home, and they're studying it. I'm going to remind you what it's like to study the Bible for the first time, because if you have forgotten, this is what it's like. There's a passage in their book, and it, re it re references Revelation chapter 10, verse 17. So they want to look it up. Is this really in there? So to find Revelation, they go to the index. There's Revelation. Wow, it's the very last book. Crazy. Page 1003. 
So now they have to use page numbers to find Revelation. I don't know when the last time it is that you used page numbers to study your Bible, but I can tell you it's what you do when you're studying for the first time. And so they use page numbers and go in, when, 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 until they get to page 1003, they get there, boom, there's Revelation. They're only a third of the way there. Now that they gotta find the Big Ten, there's the Big Ten, finally. Now they gotta find the little 17. And they flip a couple more pages, there it is. Revelation chapter 10, verse 17 and they read it. And every passage they had to study, they had to go through this arduous, almost painful task. But you know what? They were willing to do it. You know why? Because they were hungry for truth. That's all. Tell us the truth. We'll believe it. Present the truth. We'll believe it. And as they were studying, the Holy Spirit does what the only the Holy Spirit can do. He began to convict their hearts that what they were reading was absolute truth. This is what they've been looking for without even realizing it. And this is a reminder to us, you know, sometimes, guys, we live in a day and age where people try to argue with each other about stuff. It's all over Facebook. It's all over the news. We try to convince people of our opinions and our ideas about stuff. It's a constant battle of convincing, and we do it as Christians. We want to convince somebody Christianity is the only way. Convince, convince, convince. I will convince you. I will sway you. We can't. The Holy Spirit does the convicting all we do is present information. Hey, this is, this is what I know. This is what I believe. This is what has changed my life. Nobody can argue with your testimony, by the way. And you present it and let the Holy Spirit do the convicting. There was no Bible worker. There was no evangelist. There was no pastor in the home of my parents. It was them and a Bible and the Holy Spirit in this random book. The Holy Spirit will do the convicting. And so my dad told me, he says, you know, we got convicted on the Sabbath. We really did. That was like one of the first things. We just thought, wow, this is real. God set this day aside. The whole world is flaunting it. We shouldn't be doing that. And so they went to church the next Sunday. They'd never been to church before. They sat through the Sunday service. At the end of the service, they sat down with the pastor. The pastor said, hey, I've never seen you before. Are you visiting? Yes, we're visiting. We've just started studying the Bible. Congratulations, we love this. Any questions? We do have a question. We're trying to find where the Sabbath day was changed from the seventh day to the first day, we've been looking, but we're not good at studying the Bible. We don't have honestly no idea what we're doing, but we want to know where it got changed because we feel like it was kind of a big deal. Where did it get changed? They were honestly wondering. And the pastor gave them some sort of answer. Well, you know, it didn't in the Bible. Um, we like to celebrate Jesus raising from the dead. You read that in, in Matthew. Yeah, yeah, we read that. It's Sunday. He rose from the dead. Big deal. We like to celebrate that. So we have church on Sunday. That did not satisfy them. The pastor was trying to convince them and their hearts were already convicted. You see that, how that works? So the next week they went to a different Sunday church hoping that they would get a different answer from that pastor after service was over and they got the exact same response. And my dad said we realized right then and there that we were gonna start having church at home on Saturday. I said, Dad, you guys are former Muslim and agnostic having church. <laughs> I wish I could have been a fly on the wall. You know, it's funny, I was there, but I was a baby. Dad, what'd you do? What did we do, I should really be saying. Dad, what did we do? What was Sabbath like? I was two years old. What was Sabbath like? He said, well, mom would make a special meal. And I'm thinking, that's definitely not haystacks at this point in your journey. <laughs> he said, no, mom would make steak. It was like the special thing. We, it's not something we could afford to eat every day, so she would make steak on Sabbath. Okay, all right, steak. You haven't got the health message yet, that's okay. You had steak on Sabbath. Hallelujah. Did you read the Bible? Did you guys go on nature hikes? Yeah, we would read out of Scripture. That was a thing. Scripture was really important. We knew we would go on nature hikes. He said we'd go out and enjoy, especially if the weather was nice. We'd go as a family. We knew we were supposed to kind of be in nature. I would not take any alarm contracts that day. I know I wasn't supposed to work Friday night to Saturday night. I said, did you sing hymns? No, we didn't know any hymns. We'd play Christy Lane and Sandy Patty cassette tapes. They're gospel hits. You guys remember those? I do. I grew up with them. I still remember them. Sandy Patty singing her heart out to Jesus on Sabbath in my home. I said, so Dad, your Sabbath really, was really the big three S's. It was Sandy Patty, steak, and scripture. <laughs> Pretty much sums it up, he said. For a couple months, that's how my parents had Sabbath. And then they received an invitation in the mail to an evangelistic series. They didn't know it was just advertised as a Bible study series in a local gymnasium put on by the Adventist church. They didn't know it was put on the by the Adventist church. They just decided to go. And they sat in the back. They said, if this feels too culty, we'll leave. 
And the next night they moved forward a little bit because it was really fascinating and they really enjoyed it and they started slowly moving forward. My dad said by the end of the evangelistic series, we were sitting on the front row and here's why. During the week when we were doing the Bible study lessons that they were giving us, we had all these questions. So we had this notepad of questions and I've seen some of those notes that he wrote down. My dad has impeccable handwriting. He writes in all caps, I do too. And uh, he'd write this, these beautiful notes, clear, just awesome questions they had. So when they were in the evangelistic series meeting, they'd had questions. And then during the week when they were doing the Bible study lessons, they had these questions, wrote them down in this notepad. And then as soon as the meeting would end every night, they'd pale mail it to the evangelist and say, hey, we have some questions. Can you answer them? And he'd spend seriously 45 minutes every night letting them machine gun him with questions. Bless his heart. At the end of that, an evangelistic effort, my parents were baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist church, into this movement. Hallelujah. And they've never left. <laughs> and it all started because someone felt like in 1984 their purpose was to leave a little book in a laundromat in Allentown, Pennsylvania. What is your purpose today? Man, some of you are going to be called to go overseas. Some of you are going to be called maybe to give your life for the sake of the call. Some of you are going to be called to be leaders up front and pastors. That is no small task, by the way, guys. Your pastors have gone through the ringer these past few years. Love on them. God may call you to do hard things for him. He may call you to not do hard things for him. He may prompt your heart. Hey, you guys have a glow rack out there. I've seen it. I studied it. Got some great tracks in that glow rack. I like to keep them in my truck. I keep a whole set of them right in the side pocket of my truck and my van. When I go to the gas station, I stick it in the credit card swiper after I get gas. <laughs> so the next guy's got to get it out if he wants to get gas. What is your purpose? It might be to leave a book behind in a laundry drop. By the way, my dad is 81 years old. He just turned 81, just had his birthday. And you know what he's doing? That book helps for Bible study. It's still in print. He buys them by the box load. And he drives around the city of Tucson, and he leaves them in laundromats. What is your purpose in life? I'm telling you, if you don't know, do what Heather and I do. Wake up in the morning and say, God, thank you, number one, for the breath of life today. Number two, what is my purpose today? Give me, Father, a divine appointment today. I promise you from the bottom of my heart, if you make that your daily habitual morning prayer, you will have a book of stories to share with me next time I see you of how God gave you divine appointments. We have them. I'm not kidding you. We have them in a Delta terminal at the LAX airport. We had divine appointments on the bike trail when we were just in Portland doing an evangelistic series. We have divine appointments with these two Mormon boys who came up to us and 45 minutes later left with a great controversy. We have divine appointments all the time because we just say, God, please, here we are, send us. We have no idea what we're doing. We may not be giving a Bible study today. We may not be preaching a sermon today or singing a song. We're just gonna be you to somebody today. We're just gonna be Jesus to somebody. And if that means leaving a glow tract in a gas station or a book behind in a laundromat, that is our purpose today. And maybe somehow, some way, we can hasten his coming and go home and hear the rest of the story. As you watch this video and as I close with this song, I pray that you'll be inspired and blessed. And if God calls you to do something, whether easy or hard, with him behind you, there's nothing that you can't do for him. January 10th, 1962. We knew there was something wrong, but we did not know exactly what. <laughs> the doctor said, forget Rick. Put him away, put him in an institution. He's gonna be nothing but a vegetable for the rest of his life. We cried a little bit. We talked and we said, no, we're not gonna put Rick away. We're gonna bring Rick home and bring him up like any other child. We knew Rick was smart. We could tell by looking in his eyes. And when we talked to him, we, you know, he was paying attention to what we were saying. So we wanted to get a computer built so Rick could communicate with us. 
Everybody came to our house that night for Rick to say his first words, and everybody was betting, you know, what is the first words Rick is ever going to say? His mom saying, it's going to be, hi, mom, and me, the dad, saying, oh, it's going to be, hi, dad. Well, the Boston Bruins were going for the Stanley Cup, and the very first words Rick ever said was, go Bruins. Dick is a military man, so he knows a thing or two about commitment. This time, he's just months removed from a heart attack. This gift that he gives to his son, or is it the other way around? Either way, it all started when Rick heard about a charity run for a paralyzed athlete. He asked Dad, and Dad said yes. The gun went off, and we went off with all the other runners, and everybody thought that Rick and I would just go to the corner and turn around and come back. Well, we didn't. We finished the whole five miles coming in next to last, but not last. And when we got home that night, Rick wrote on his computer, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like my disability disappears. So that was a very powerful message to me that we finally found a sport that Rick could get involved in just like everybody else. is my motivator he inspires me to me he's the one out there competing and i'm just loaning him my arms and my legs so that he can compete there's just something that gets into me when i'm out there competing with rick that i can't explain it and we're able to go faster and it, it's just an unbelievable feeling rick and i love the Ironman triathlon to be out there competing with the best triathletes in the world to be accepted to compete along with these triathletes just to be out there on that pier with all the other triathletes and then waiting in the water for that cannon to go off it, it was just so exciting so the feeling coming down the finish line at the leaky drive it, it's just an awesome experience with the crowd there, all the excitement, the noise, and the announcers announcing all the adrenaline just gets flowing. I may be disabled, but I live a very fulfilling life. And if someone takes the time to get to know me, they will realize that I am no different than anyone else. Here he is, he graduated from public high school. He's graduated from college. He's out there competing in road races and triathlons. He lives a happier life probably than 95% of the population. Rick would tell you that, uh, you know, if he... If he was physically able to do something, that he'd probably play basketball or football or hockey. But then he always says, no, the first thing he'd do is sit down, have me sit down in his wheelchair and he'd push me. You know, it really makes me feel good that, uh, that you know, he appreciates, you know, what I'm trying to do to help him out, and he'd do the same thing for me. Our message is, yes, you can. You can do anything you want to do. As long as you make up your mind, you can do it. If you have ever searched for the meaning of life, stop. The answer lies right here.
So you've kind of grown up in a way with Oakwood. And so, um, you know, Scott is a pastor by, by all proper definitions, but he's, he's not employed by any conference or anything. So he depends on love offerings for his ministry. And clearly you can tell uh, that he's a prodigious talent. If Scott wanted to follow the ways of many musicians and moved down to Nashville for other reasons than it is written, he could have done quite well in the secular world. Um, but that wasn't his calling. So um, let's support him. Uh, before he comes up for the benediction, uh, you know, it's very easy to give. If you have uh, some cash, we'll do a, a love offering here. But if you don't have any cash, don't let that stop you. Uh, you can go to scottmichaelbennett.com. It's very quick and easy. Um, right down, you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll see some pre-selected opportunities to give. You know, uh, click on 50 or $100. I imagine that 40-foot tour bus is expensive to fuel these days. And if you can't, if you can't afford that, then, you know, pick one of the smaller options and maybe your blessing can pick one of the bigger options. Let's, um, let's show Scott how much we appreciate his, his conviction, his calling to ministry, his sticking with God, and uh, ministering to the saints uh, here and abroad. Um, so I'm going to ask that, um, do we have a, we have a, at the, at, on the way out? Okay, so we have some uh, collection plates, some deacons uh, that we'll be collecting on the way out if you brought cash. If you didn't bring cash, please do it. It's very quick and easy. ScottMichaelBennett.com, ScottMichaelBennett.com. Uh, for those of you watching online, I know you've been blessed too. Uh, please just go to his website, 
show him that uh, we support he and his wife. You know, when he first came, he wasn't married, wasn't, didn't even have a girlfriend, was just trying to get through college. Now he's married, a couple beautiful girls, and, uh, and a ministry that um, is really uh, touching people. Thank you very much, Scott.